Scarlet and Violet came out last month and immediately became the most polarizing Pokemon games of all time. Extremely fun, yet extremely broken. In this video, I'll be trying to beat the entirety of Pokemon Violet without taking any damage. That includes the Champion, Team Star, and Titan Pokemon storylines along with the Area Zero finale. If any of my Pokemon take damage, I'll have to reset to my last save point. That said, I'm allowing myself to save whenever I want to, though I'll try to keep my total number of resets under 10, excluding how many ever are needed for the starter and the first rival battle. Let's see how the run went. As is tradition, I name myself W, representing exactly what I aim to achieve this run. I look outside into the void and head downstairs to witness the Academy Director Clavel teleporting through the front door. I hope they teach that at school. After making sure to turn autosaving off, I walk toward Nimona's house where I can choose my starter. Immediately after my selection, I'm going to be forced into a battle with Nimona who uses the starter weak to yours. However, her starter has nearly maxed out individual values or IVs. IVs are random, generally unchangeable values assigned to each Pokemon. So basically, Nimona's starter is going to have fantastic stats this entire game. To win this battle, my Pokemon is going to need to outspeed and KO Nimona's in one hit, since the AI forces her to use an attacking move on turn 1. Koikoko isn't fast enough and Quaxley isn't strong enough, meaning this can only be done with Sprigatito, which also needs to have an attack boosting nature, and some good IVs to give it an attack stat of 13, and a speed stat of 12 or 13. All in all, there's just under a 5% chance I can get this starter. After several attempts, I successfully pull a Sprigatito that meets these criteria. I save and begin the battle. Now I just need one critical hit. A 1 in 24 chance isn't that bad, right? I tried this more than 100 times and didn't get a single critical hit, so something's a little fishy here. Before the most recent patch was released, Battle Stadium, the medium for Scarlet and Violet's online battles, used the same RNG seed for each battle. In doubles, this meant that you could guarantee your turn 1 sheer cold to hit and one hit KO an opposing Pokemon, as long as you successfully used Fake Out or landed an Air Slash earlier in the turn. And this applied to every single battle. Anyways, it wouldn't surprise me if Nimona was actually immune to critical hits in this battle due to a similar situation. I open up a new file on a different Switch account and go through the entire process again, running in random circles in case the RNG is based on time or movement. I also repeatedly click scratch to open up more opportunities to test for a critical hit. Still no luck. The weird thing is, damage rolls are still present, as Sprigatito's leafage would do about 90% of Quaxley's health 1 16th of the time, while dealing around 65% the other 15 16 of the time. I guess Game Freak just doesn't really want people doing the first 0.1% of this challenge anymore, as the first rival battle was actually impossible to beat Damageless and Sword and Shield as well. Anyways, I'm gonna allow this unintentionally scripted damage and see if the rest of Violet can be completed. Sprigatito takes a hit for the first and last time, then KOs Nimona's Quaxley to end my 9 hours of suffering. The next battle is against another supporting character, Arvin, who only has one level 5 Squavet. However, Squavet is bulky, so I'll need to level up Sprigatito a lot. While it can't KO any wild Pokemon yet, it still gains EXP when I catch them. So I catch the level 2 Lechonk from the tutorial and a level 4 Scatterbug. Both of these Pokemon have very high catch rates but aren't guaranteed captures. Usually, continuing to capture these Pokemon would be risky, but in this game, once you catch a certain Pokemon, your chance to get a critical capture on later instances of that Pokemon significantly increase. A critical capture requires only one Shake, not three. In other words, I'm probably guaranteed to catch every Lechonk and Scatterbug now that I already have one of each. In fact, I got a critical capture on every single occasion. Once Brigatito is at level 9, I can start battling wild Pokemon. During that process, I decided to catch a Wingle because I thought a Pelipper with the Drizzle ability would have some pretty powerful water attacks. Unfortunately, it's pretty slow, and there's an easily obtainable water Pokemon coming up that outclasses it in several ways. Sprigatito eventually hits level 13 and learns Magical Leaf, a 60 base power special move. This will be useful against Squovet, which has a low special defense stat. I also evolve two of my Scatterbugs into Spoopas in the process. I fall down a cliff and am saved by my Rotom Phone. I attempt to feed Miraidon on the Rotom Phone, but apparently that won't do the trick. Sandwich it is. After following Miraidon through a cave, I am attacked by a level 40 Houndoom. Since I can't run, I fight. Houndoom uses Crunch, and Sprigatito returns to its Pokeball to avoid taking damage. Miraidon can do the dirty work. Once I exit the cave, I battle Arvin and his Squovet. Magical Leaf picks up the KO as expected. Something cool about this game is that regular trainers are not mandatory to fight. Wild Pokemon give similar amounts of EXP though, so I'll be avoiding trainers for the most part. On the way to Los Platos, I find the aforementioned good water type Pokemon, Magikarp. It has no attacking moves, so capturing it is a guarantee. 
I name it Jerry. I'm running low on Pokeballs, so I make sure to restock in Los Platos before heading to the Academy in Mesa Goza. I also purchase several Poke Dolls, which allow you to always escape from wild battles. These will be useful if I accidentally run into very strong Pokemon that outspeed my own, preventing mine from consistently running away. EXP is getting a bit hard to come by, so I'm going to want to battle some stronger Pokemon. Many of them can only be KO'd in two hits though. So, how do I solve this? The answer is crouching. The crouching feature, enhanced by moving through tall grass, allows you to sneak up on a Pokemon from behind and catch them off guard by throwing your Pokeball at it. This initiates a battle where the opposing Pokemon cannot move during the first turn. So, you either get one additional attack off, or a risk-free capture attempt. I probably should have used this for the first Scatterbug and Wingle I caught, but didn't realize in time. Spurgatito hits level 16 and evolves into Florigato. Shortly after, my Spoopas evolve into Vivions. Another battle with Nimona precedes entering Mesa Goza, but this one's actually doable. Florigato KOs Quaxly with Leafage, and to add insult to injury picks up a critical hit. Nimona terastalizes her Palmy, only for it to be taken out by Magical Leaf, shielding herself from critical hits one battle and terastalizing before I have the option to win another. Fair enough. After bullying a couple of Team Star Grunts as retribution for supposedly bullying Penny, I enter the Academy and can now begin each of the three story routes. I'm going to hold off on the Team Star route due to a lack of familiarity with how auto-battling works. I'll focus primarily on the gym battles for now, with a few Titan battles sprinkled in. Regardless, that's going to involve several hours of creating and training up a new team. To make matters tougher, I can't really buy any good Pokeballs until I complete a few gyms, so I'll need to obtain these Pokeballs in the wild. That means a lot of exploring, and I might as well visit the cities where some gym leaders reside so that I can easily fly to them later. I visit Cortondo, Porto Marinata, and Cascarafa, where I plan to finally start my first gym challenge, which involves delivering a forgotten wallet and winning an auction. I'll also need to battle a gym trainer with a level 28 Floatzel, which has a base speed of 115. That's a good bit faster than anything on my team, meaning I'll need to evolve Florigato first. To help it battle stronger Pokémon, I fly back to Mesa Goza and make a purchase from the Delibird Present Store. The Miracle Seed will boost the power of Florigato's Grass-type attacks by 20%. With that item, Florigato is now certainly strong enough to take on another feature of these games, Terra Raids. Well, at least the 1-star one ones. In Terra Raid battles, three CPUs and I have to take down a terrestrialized Pokémon with a giant health bar. Normally, when you catch a Pokémon in the wild, their Terra type will be the same as one of their typings. However, these raid Pokémon will often have Terra types different from their own. For example, this Litleo, which would normally have a Fire and Normal Terra type, has a Rock Terra type. Also, if you defeat a raid Pokémon, you have a 100% chance of capturing it afterwards. Since these raids are random and not replicable in another save file, I'm banning myself from terrestrializing the Pokémon that I catch from these. Florigato won it KOs the Litleo, and I catch it. It should help me with the Bug and Grass-type gym leaders, Katie and Brashius. Continuing the team building process, I use an Ultra Ball I found to capture a Makuhita in South Province Area 3. Makuhita is one of the few Pokémon in this game that can learn Fake Out, a weak normal-type attacking move that almost always goes first and flinches the opponent. The drawback is that it can only be used on the first turn the user is out. This move can help get through Pokémon with the ability Sturdy, which prevents them from being KO'd in one hit. Assuming the Pokémon with Fake Out is faster, it can get off two attacks consecutively. That brings us to the only problem with Makuhita and its evolution, Hariyama. They're extremely slow. I'll deal with that problem when it eventually matters, but for now, it's back to grinding. The safest, easiest way for me to level up Florigato is by battling Fanpies in the Asado Desert. They're pretty common, and award a solid amount of EXP for being a pre-evolved Pokémon. If you want to battle Dawn fans for even more EXP, you'll have to crouch, but that's a difficult and probably inefficient thing to do in an open sand area. Eventually, Makuhita evolves into Hariyama, and Florigato evolves into Miascarada, a Grass and Dark type. This is where it learns one of the best moves in the game, Flower Trick. Flower Trick is a 70 base power, 100% accurate grass type move that always crits, so in effect, it's a 105 base power move that ignores attack drops of the user and the defense boosts of the target. Finally, I can start the Water Gym Challenge now. The Gym Trainer leads off with his Floatzel, which in addition to its speed, has a priority move, Aqua Jet. Priority moves like Aqua Jet and Quick Attack go before regular moves like Tackle or Scratch. However, they're usually pretty weak, so high AI opposing trainers like Hugo here don't like using them unless they're super effective or able to pick up a KO. Floatzel will use Swift instead, which hits Meowskirata neutrally. No Aqua Jet comes out, and Flower Trick KOs Floatzel along with the following Clauncher. After delivering the wallet to the gym leader, Kofu, and winning an auction, I've completed the gym challenge. In addition to being able to battle Kofu, completing this event also unlocks the auctions, where I can get some useful items such as Pokeballs I haven't beaten enough gym leaders to buy yet, or bunches of Eevee-reducing berries. 
EVs, or effort values, are points gained from defeating Pokémon in battle. These points are directed towards various stats based on the Pokémon defeated. EVs cap out at 252 per stat and 510 in total. The more EVs you get in a stat, the higher that stat increases. I battled a ton of Lechonks and Scatterbugs at the beginning of the game, which awarded Meowskarata a bunch of useless HP and defense EVs. Since I only care about attack and speed on Meowskarata, these EV reducing berries can help me better optimize its stats later if necessary. Back to Kofu. None of his Pokémon have any threatening abilities or priority moves, so this should be a breeze. He leads off with Veluza, a new water and psychic type. It faints to Flower Trick. Wugtrio is up next, but it waints to a Flower Trick as well. Kerbominable, normally an ice fighting type, immediately terrestrializes into a water type, so it meets the same fate as its two buddies. Opposing trainers with the ability to always terrestrialize on turn one of their last Pokémon being out, even if it's suboptimal to. I am not complaining though. Miraidon has been feeling a bit slow, so I go and challenge the first Titan, Cloth. I'm not really sure how the Titan HP bars work, but they might just be twice the size of a regular HP bar. These Titans have levels though, and this Cloth is only level 16, so it's no match for one Terra Grass Flower Trick. The bar caps out around 10% HP, and it eats a Nerva Mystica to gain some stat buffs. Arvin helps out this time with a Pokémon of his own, though his help doesn't really matter here. Miraidon eats a sandwich and gets faster. With the newfound speed, I set a checkpoint in Lavincia before grinding up again to evolve Litleo into Pyroar. Two levels later, it learns Flamethrower. Time to take on the next gym, back in Cortondo. After suffering to move an inflatable olive. Katie has several bug types, none of which have priority moves. Flamethrower takes out Nimble, Tarantula, and Teddy Ursa. Something I should mention is that almost every major trainer's ace Pokémon has 25 IVs in every stat, along with 252 HP EVs. This includes Kofu's Crabominable and Katie's Teddy Ursa. Pokémon that aren't the trainers' as aces often have 20 IVs across the board and no EVs at all. Before starting the Grass Gym in Artisan, I have to battle Nimona. I forgot that this was a battle, so I led Pyroar into a Rock-type Rockruff. Rockruff gets level diffed. Palmy doesn't have Quick Attack, so I can safely KO it with Pyroar. Meowskarata KOs her Quaxwell to finish off the battle. It takes me 10 minutes to find Tencent Flora, but I advance to the battle against Brashius. No priority moves here either, but there's one problem with his final Pokémon, Pseudowoodo. It has the ability Sturdy. This is why Hariyama's on the team though. I terrestrialize it and have it use Fake Out, dealing about a third of Pseudowoodo's HP. Pseudowoodo automatically flinches, so I get to move again. A Terra boosted Force Palm wins the battle. For future reference, if a Pokémon terrestrializes into a type it already possesses, it will gain an extra boost from those moves, turning the same type attack bonus modifier from 1.5 times to 2. It will also keep the 1.5 times bonus on any type it loses by terrestrializing. If the Terra type is completely new, then the new type's bonus will also be 1.5. Anyways, that's three gym leaders and one Titan Pokémon down. I fly back to Lavincia to take on Iona's electric type gym. Is that a Pokestar Studios logo? This is definitely the most dedicated Pokefan in existence, bar none. Iono sends out a Watchroll first, which has Quick Attack, so I have Meowskarata go for its own. Bellybolt faints to Flower Trick the next turn. For some reason, Bellybolt's ability, which powers up its next Electric-type move, needlessly activates before it faints. Luxio's Intimidate is ignored due to Flower Trick's critical hit, so it falls as well. Iono's last Pokémon is Miss Magius, which you guessed it gets tricked by a flower. I don't think I've ever used one move so often in any challenge before. I fly back to Mesa Goza to buy some items from the Deli Bird Present Store. First up is the Charcoal, which boosts Fire-type moves by 20%. I also purchase a variety of Pokeballs. I give the Charcoal to Pyroar and teach it Protect, then travel north of Lavincia to reach the next Titan, Orthoworm. Flamethrower takes both Round 1 and Round 2. I meant to Protect the second time to allow Arvin to possibly get some damage off, but forgot to click it. No harm, no foul. Keep in mind, I can't terrestrialize with Pyroar, and even if I could, a Rock-type Terra probably wouldn't be beneficial. Miraidon eats the sandwich and increases its vertical to about 96 inches or 2.5 meters. I think the Titan storyline is definitely my favorite of the three. Let me know what your favorite storyline was in the comments section below, and why you think so. I love reading discourse like this, and also the funny numbers going up for the algorithm. I sell a bunch of the treasures I've picked up throughout my journey, and start hunting for my next Pokémon, Pink Urchin. I find one on the shores outside of Lavincia, sneak up behind it, and catch it with a quick ball. But wait, it has a base speed of 15, which is the lowest of any fully evolved Pokémon in the game, so it's arguably the worst Pokémon for this challenge. So why would I choose it? In Lavincia, there's an NPC named Blossom who wants to trade a Haunter for a Pink Urchin. 
Haunter's got great special attack and speed, so it'll fit perfectly on the team. This isn't the first time Haunter's been involved in an in-game trade. In Diamond, Pearl, and Platinum, an NPC named Mindy in Snowpoint City offers a Haunter for a Metacham. Haunter evolves into Gengar when traded, but Mindy's Haunter is holding an Everstone, blocking it from evolving. Imagine how many kids' hopes were crushed. Thanks, Mindy. Anyways, the point I'm getting to is that Blossom's Haunter does not actually have an Everstone, meaning it's Gengar time. Gengar is literally a Haunter on steroids. It hits harder, it's faster, and gets slightly better coverage. However, it loses the Levitate ability, which would have provided immunity to ground-type attacks. I guess the nickname it was given doesn't fit that well anymore either. I'm going to start EV training my Pokémon, so I don't need to overlevel that much anymore. I purchased the Power Bracer, Power Lens, and Power Anklet from the Mesa Goza Delibird store, which adds 8 extra EVs per battle in attack, special attack, or speed respectively. Meowskarada is now strong enough to take out all Golducks at Kasaroya Lake, so gaining EXP is a breeze. Also, since Gengar was traded, it gains boosted EXP. If it holds the Power Lens, it gets 10 special attack EVs per Golduck, 2 from Golduck itself, and 8 from the Lens. After repeating the process with the Power Anklet meant for speed, I teach Gengar the TM for Thunderbolt, which I found near Porto Marinata. This allows me to take on a third Titan, Bombardier. I purchase an Expert Belt first, which boosts the power of super effective attacks by 20%. As expected, an Expert Belt boosted 130 base power maxed out special attack Thunderbolt from an overleveled Gengar is enough. The other two Titans are a lot higher level than the first three, so I don't expect to be taking them on for a while. I run through a cave in the South Province to reach the supposed second hardest gym leader, Tulip, a Psychic type trainer. I get through the Just Dance 34 challenge pretty easily, but am going to need to battle the gym leader and Nimona back to back, meaning the same lead Pokemon for both. That's Giraffarig's evolution for Tulip, and Lycanroc for Nimona. Lycanroc has two priority moves, Acceleroc and Quick Attack. It also has the Dark-type move Bite. Bite is not very effective against Meowskarada, but super effective against Gengar, removing the possibility of getting hit by a priority Acceleroc. I switch Gengar to the front of my party, and reteach it Dark Pulse. In this game, you can relearn old moves whenever you want to, and you don't have to use Heart Scales or anything like that. Tulip leads with the Ferrigiraf, a normal and psychic type Pokemon. Shadow Ball doesn't affect it, but an Expert Belt boost to Dark Pulse sure does. Gardevoir is up next, and feints to Shadow Ball. Espathra is third, and gets knocked out by another Shadow Ball. Tulip's last Pokemon is Florgis, which turns into a psychic type only to be knocked out by Meowskarada's Night Slash. Three more gym badges to go. I forgot to Terrastalize Gengar, which has a Ghost Terra type, but Shadow Ball goes first and knocks out Lycanroc. Meowskarada's Night Slash knocks out Gumi, and then I remember to Terrastalize Gengar against Palmo though it probably didn't matter. Flower Trick takes out Quackable to end the 8 Pokemon boss rush. Next stop, Medali and the best character in the game. Larry the Legend has a team of normal types, starting with Kamala, which has Sucker Punch, a 70 base power dark type priority move that only works if the target is attacking that turn. Sucker Punch is not very effective against Meowskarada though, so I switch it to the front of the party. Uh, where did all the people go? Kamala doesn't use Sucker Punch, and a Flower Trick picks up the knockout. Larry's next Pokémon is Dunsparce's new evolution, Da Dunsparce. A terrestrialized flower trick does the trick this time. Staraptor is up last, so I switch in Gengar, which is holding an Expert Belt. Everyone gives their spirit energy to Larry, but it doesn't matter since Thunderbolt should- Oh, I forgot he could do that. Well, that sucks. I just keep in Meowskarata the second time around, since flower trick ignores Intimidate. This is the physical manifestation of Burnout. There are two gyms left, both hidden on top of Glaciado Mountain. Grusha of Glaciado is a nice type gym leader, while Rhyme of Montenevera uses ghost types. Rhyme has a lot of priority moves on her team, so I'll try to beat Grusha first. I set a flying checkpoint at Glaciado's Poke Center, then review my team. The Pokémon that best deals with ice types is Pyroar. Note Pyroar's ability though, Rivalry. Rivalry is an ability that boosts the power of moves by 25% when targeting an opposing Pokémon sharing the same gender as the user. However, moves are weakened by 25% when targeting the opposite gender. Crucius, Frostmoth, and Altaria are female, while his Bear Tick and Satitan are male. Bear Tick has Aqua Jet, and Satitan has the ability Thick Fat, which halves Fire and Ice type damage, so I wouldn't be using Pyroar against them anyways. Both Pyroar and Meowskarada have a bunch of garbage EVs, so I decide to finally use some of the EV reducing berries I've accumulated. I redistribute EVs into Pyroar's special attack and Meowskarada's attack, then head to Kaskarafa's Delibird Present store to purchase a spell tag. This is basically the Ghost-type version of a Charcoal or Miracle Seed. Because there's a battle with Nimona preceding the Gym Leader, I switch Gengar to the front of the party and give it the Spell Tag. 
This battle almost goes exactly like the last, with the difference being that I remembered to Terastalize turn 1. Shadow Ball takes out Lycanroc, Meowskarata's Night Slash knocks out Slagoo, another Shadow Ball KOs Palmot, and Flower Trick ends Quackwivel. I finish the Snow Slope run in less than half the time limit, and can now start the gym battle. I lead with Pyroar and deal a solid 250% to Frostmoth with Flamethrower. I bring in Meowskarata for Bear Tick, Terastalize, and KO it with Flower Trick. Flower Trick also KOs the Titan the following turn. I kept in Meowskarata for Altaria, since Flower Trick was somehow a guaranteed KO, likely due to Altaria having a weaker defense than special defense. Pyroar's Flamethrower would have worked too though. Time to devise a plan against the 8th and final gym. Rhyme's gym requires you to fight in a double battle. Her two lead Pokémon are Banette, with Icy Wind, Sucker Punch, and Shadow Sneak, along with Mimikyu, with Light Screen, Shadow Sneak, and Slash. Shadow Sneak is the Ghost-type version of moves like Quick Attack, Aqua Jet, and Accelerock. Mimikyu has the ability Disguise, which basically just blocks the first attack that hits it at the cost of 1 8th of its HP. So to win this battle, I'm going to need to block three different priority moves and get three different hits off all in one turn. Fortunately, there are certain abilities that can block priority moves against the ability possessing Pokémon or its allies. These abilities are Bruxish's Dazzling, Serena's Queenly Majesty, and for Ridgeraps Armor Tail. Bruxish is strong and relatively fast, so I go search for one first. I don't find one in the next 30 minutes though, so I go after for a giraffe. Yeah, it only has 60 base speed, but opposing trainers don't ever EV train their Pokémon except in HP. I catch a giraffe rig with a quick ball, but it has inner focus, which would turn into the wrong ability after evolution. The next giraffe rig gets critically caught and has the right ability. I name it Beam Team. So that solves the priority issue. What about Mimikyu's Disguise? Luckily, there's another ability that can solve that problem, Mold Breaker. Mold Breaker is an ability that allows the user to ignore all other abilities when attacking. There are only two good Mold Breaker Pokémon in the game though, with Haxorus being one and Tinkaton being the other. I think Haxorus is generally better, but I felt I hadn't been using enough Paldean Pokémon. The only Paldean Mon getting any usage has been Meowskarata. So I catch a Tinkatuff, Tinkaton's pre-evolution. Tinkaton can KO Mimikyu, so that means Perigiraf will have to KO Banette along with one of the following two Pokémon, Toxtricity or Houndstone. The Shadow Ball TM isn't available until after beating the gym, so Ferigiraf's best super effective move is… Crunch. Fortunately, its base attack isn't actually that bad, sitting at 90. I buy another Power Bracer and Anklet, then start EV training against some Q-Fence in the East Province. Once attack and speed have been maxed out, I head back to Casaroya Lake to focus on the leveling portion and Tinkatuff evolves into Tinkaton. It wants to learn one of the most broken moves in the game, Gigaton Hammer. This is a 160 base power, 100% accurate steel type move with exactly one drawback. You can't use it twice in a row. It's not a forced recharge turn either, like Hyper Beam or Giga Impact. You can just protect or attack with another move if you want. At level 37, Giraffe Rig learns Crunch. It could have technically evolved at level 33, but I wanted it to learn Crunch a bit earlier. It was at this point my game started running at around 3 frames per second. I deposit my higher leveled Pokémon and start exclusively leveling up Tinkaton, Gyarados, and Ferrigiraf. I kind of want to try to beat the Elite Four without being over leveled. During that process, I find a Routes and catch it. I thought it would be useful for the Team Star Raids, given that three of the bases have types weak to Gardevoir. Dark, Poison, and Fighting. Might as well train it up now though. I am very worried for that Gogoat's life. Before battling the gym, I grab the Wide Lens from the Lavincia Delibird Presence and have Tinkaton relearn Metal Claw. Metal Claw is only 95% accurate, but the Wide Lens will prevent it from missing. Level 57 should be sufficient to take on the Gym Leader, but I still need to deal with three different Gym Trainers. The first two will be no problem, but the last, MC Sledge, uses a Drift Blim and Sableye. Drift Blim has the ability Aftermath, which deals 25% to a Pokémon that KOs it with a Contact move. I still need to use Brigiraf since the second Gym Trainer has a Hunter with Sucker Punch, and all three Gym Trainer battles are consecutive. So I need to find a non-contact move that Ferrigiraf can KO Drifblim with. I find and KO a few Pachirisus and Pichus in the South Province to get materials from them. In this game, you need Pokémon materials to make TMs, which have now been reverted to single use. These items let me purchase another TM for Thunderbolt from the TM machine at a Poke Center, which I promptly teach to Ferrigiraf. Even without being EV trained in Special Attack, Ferrigiraf is more than powerful enough. The first two Gym Trainers have a Grievard and Shuppet, which faint to a Gigaton Hammer and Crunch. The next trainers Mistrevis and Haunter meet the same fate. MC Sledge is the third trainer, but his Sableye gets sledgehammered and his Drifflim falls to Thunderbolt. That sets up the last battle before I can take on the Elite Four. Rhyme leads off with her Mimikyu and Banette, and I send out the Steel Beam team. Banette's Sucker Punch fails, a Wide Lens Enhanced Metal Claw takes out Mimikyu, and Ferrigiraf's Crunch KOs Banette. 
The crowd gives my Pokemon attack boosts, meaning I definitely did not need to level up this much. Whoops. Rhyme sends out her Toxtricity and Houndstone. Gigaton Hammer wasn't used on the first turn, so it can be used now. Houndstone falls to Gigaton Hammer, and the Ghost-type Toxtricity faints to Crunch. Something I forgot to mention earlier is that raids can drop mints, which can change a Pokémon's nature. For example, to increase Gardevoir's special attack, I can give it the Modest Mint. Vergiraffe gets permanently boxed, and I regather most of my original team to decide on my next move. There are six major battles left in the storyline, consisting of the Elite Four, Champion, and Nimona. The second Elite Four member, Poppy, has a Magnezone with Sturdy. Tinkaton ignores that due to Mold Breaker, but isn't strong enough to KO it at level 61 or 62, even with a 4 times super effective ground type move, Bulldoze. That means I have to find a different solution. That solution is your standard electric rodent of the game, Pommy, which I named Tree. In Cascarafa, I buy a Mirror Herb, which copies the first stat boost an opponent obtains. A Mirror Herb also has another useful effect regarding learning egg moves. In this game, breeding actually isn't necessary to learn egg moves. One of Pommies is Fake Out, which Tinkaton already has. Tinkaton and Pommy don't share the same egg group, but if I give Pommy a Mirror Herb, keep those two as the only Pokémon in the party, start a picnic, and eat a sandwich, Pommy will now know Fake Out. I use a Lonely Mint on it to give it an attack boosting nature. Tinkaton's job is done, so the Steel Beam team has officially retired. Pommy evolves into Pommo at level 18, but the final evolution is a bit harder to obtain. I have to walk around with Pommo for 1000 steps before leveling it up. I don't know if this actually counted, but I really hope so. Eventually, Pomo evolves into Pomit, and I start leveling up all my Pokémon to 61. Once that's done, I grab some remaining items and TMs. I buy an Air Balloon from Kaskarafa's Delibird store, which gives a Pokémon immunity from Ground-type moves until it gets hit. Next, in the Lavincia store, I purchase a Black Belt and Twisted Spoon, which boosts the power of Fighting and Psychic-type moves, respectively. Near Alphernada, I pick up the TM for Sludge Bomb, the best Poison-type move Gengar can learn. Lastly, on top of the Lavincia Lighthouse, I find the TM for Icy Wind. I didn't actually need to get any more Maridon power-ups to reach the Elite Four, though I'm not quite sure this was an intended path. Here's a team recap before entering the Pokémon League. Miascarada is holding an Air Balloon with the moves Quick Attack, U-Turn, Flower Trick, and Night Slash. You might be wondering why a Grass-type would want an Air Balloon, but I'll get there shortly. Pomet is holding the Black Belt and has the moves Quick Attack, Close Combat, Double Shock, and Fake Out. Double Shock is a 120 base power move that gets rid of the user's electric type. If the user isn't electric type, the move doesn't work. However, if I terastalize Pommet into an electric type, I can use Double Shock as many times as I want. Gardevoir is holding the Twisted Spoon and has the moves Calm Mind, Psychic, Moonblast, and Dream Eater. Only the middle two are relevant though. Jerry the Gyarados is holding the Expert Belt, with its only relevant move being Waterfall. I have not EV trained it properly, nor have I used it in a single major battle up until this point. Gengar is holding the spell tag and has four attacking moves, Thunderbolt, Sludge Bomb, Icy Wind, and Shadow Ball. Pyroar is still holding the charcoal and will only use Flamethrower. To challenge the Elite Four, I must pass an interview first. I answer every question truthfully and proceed to fail the interview because of it. Does that count as a reset? Anyways, I say I actually like Pokémon the second time around, so I pass. Rika is the first Elite Four member up, and uses ground types. She leads with Whiskash, while I lead with Meowskarada. Flower Trick knocks it out. Next up is Camerupt, which allows Jerry to get his first major screen time of the run. It only took a 4 times super effective Expert Belt boosted hit, but a KO is a KO. Third is Donphan, which has Sturdy. I switch in Pommet, in order to fake it out first. Pommet would just barely miss out on the KO with Close Combat, so I need to use a different Pokémon. Earthquake is pretty much guaranteed to be used due to being super effective and able to KO Pommet, so I switch into Meowskarada. Earthquake goes off, but doesn't work due to the Air Balloon. I Terastalize the Cat, then Flower Trick Donphan, Dugtrio, and a Ground-type Clawed Sire to win the battle. Next up is the literal 5-year-old, Poppy, who uses Steel-types. I take the Expert Belt from Gyarados and give it to Gengar, then switch Pyroar to the front of the party. Poppy opens up the battle with the Copperaja, though it's no match for a rivalry-boosted Flamethrower. I switch in Gengar against the Bronzong and KO it with Shadow Ball. Next is Corviknight, which would actually survive a flamethrower from Pyroar due to being male. Rivalry is a double-edged sword. An Expert Belt boosted Thunderbolt from Gengar knocks out the bird. I send in Pommet against a sturdy Magnezone, and now Fake Out into Close Combat should work. Poppy's Ace is a Tinkaton, which surprisingly doesn't have Fake Out. All Tinkatons are females, so I send in Pyroar. One final flamethrower nets me the victory. Guess who's back? Larry leads off with Tropius, which gets easily KO'd by Sludge Bomb. 
next to Staraptor, which gets knocked out by Thunderbolt. Gardevoir's Moonblast knocks out Altaria the following turn, leaving Larry with two Pokémon. He sends an Oricorio, which should get KO'd by a Terrastalize Shadow Ball. But in one of the most vital situations of the run, I forget to Terra. Shadow Ball only does 80%, so Oricorio gets to attack. But naturally, it chooses to go for Teeter Dance instead of any one of its three damaging attacks, so Gengar gets confused. That gives me a two-thirds chance to still win the battle. I terrestrialize Gengar, and it breaks through confusion to fell Oricorio. Larry's flying type ace is Flamigo, but it stands no match to one of Pomet's double shocks. Only one Elite Four member left. I can apparently access the boxes for some reason, so I'm able to retrieve the Wide Lens from Tinkaton and give it to Gengar. I then give the newly freed up Expert Belt to Gardevoir. Hassel leads off with a Noivern, which gets knocked out by a 100% accurate Icy Wind, thanks to the Wide Lens. Gardevoir's speed EVs allow it to outspeed the rest of Hassel's team, so Moonblast KOs Axorus, Psychic KOs Dragalge, a second Moonblast KOs Flapple, and a third Moonblast KOs Bixcalibur. Time to battle the champion, Heatha. There's not much setup needed, but I give Gengar the spell tag again, and Meowskar out of the Miracle Seed. Geetha's first Pokémon is a Spathra, but one Shadow Ball is easily enough to take it out. Next up is an Avalug, which cannot take a rivalry boosted Flamethrower from Pyroar. Third is Bisharp's new evolution, King Gambit. It surprisingly doesn't have Sucker Punch, so Palmet can safely KO it with close combat. Fourth is Go-Goat, which falls to Gengar's Sludge Bomb. Geetha's penultimate Pokémon is Veluza, which just becomes another Gengar victim. Glimora is Geetha's ace, and can terrestrialize from a Rock Poison type into a Mono Rock type. Which is better for me. Both of us terrestrialize, but Meowskarada moves first, firing off a lethal flower trick to make me a champion. I'm gonna be honest, Geetha is one of the most underwhelming teams for a champion. Like, what are Go-Goat and Avalug doing up there? I fly back to Mesa Goza and battle Nimona one final time. Gengar terrestrializes and KOs Lycanroc with Shadow Ball, and Pomet falls the same way. I send out my own Pomet to fight Nimona's the Dunsparce, and a Black Belt boosted close combat knocks it out. Two more close combats knock out Orthworm and Gudra. Of course, Nimona's last Pokémon is Quackable, but Meowskarada's Flower Trick eliminates it for the fourth time this run. I'll try to finish off the Titans next. I fly over to the Asado Desert, and run into a giant metallic Dawn fan named Iron Treads. Iron Treads is a Steel and Ground-type Pokémon, so Palmet's probably my best option. Close Combat deals enough damage, and Iron Treads sinks into the ground. Eating another sandwich lets me ride on Glide, which makes accessing the next Titan's location easy. Though terribly time-consuming. The final Titan actually consists of two Pokémon, Dodonzo and Tatsugiri. Assuming Tatsugiri has its default ability Commander, all of Dondozo's stats are boosted by two stages each when both Pokémon are on the field at the same time. Tatsugiri also gains immunity from opposing attacks, though it can't attack itself due to being inside Dondozo's mouth. There are three parts to this Titan challenge, one against an unboosted Dondozo, one against a boosted Dondozo, and one against a boosted Tatsugiri by itself. The problem with this is that I don't know if the boosts are from Tatsugiri's ability, or just the general boosts that all Titans get after eating Urba Mystica. Flower Trick should theoretically ignore the stat boosts, so I send out Meowskarada. Flower Trick KOs Dondozo when unboosted, and then again while boosted, so now there's just Tatsugiri. Unfortunately, Tatsugiri is a Water and Dragon type, meaning Flower Trick won't be super effective. I taught Meowskarada Protect just in case, so Arvin's Greedunt could use Takedown to deal free damage, or Tail Whip to lower Tatsugiri's defense before I attack. Greedunt goes for Takedown, which definitely doesn't do enough. Flower Trick misses out on the KO by about 15%, and Dragon Pulse deals damage to force me to reset. Flower Trick's damage was a little bit weird there though. Dondozo has approximately double the physical bulk of Tatsugiri at level 55. Since Flower Trick is neutral against Tatsugiri, and super effective against Dondozo, it should have done around the same percentage of damage to both. However, while it one-hit KO'd Dondozo, it only dealt about two-thirds of Tatsugiri's health. This makes me think that the boosted Dondozo stat buffs are ignored, while Tatsugiri's stat buffs aren't for some reason. If that's true, then I'm probably better off using a stronger Pokémon like Pomet. After failing another time due to poor preparation, I teach Pomet Protect, and fly to Keskarafa to get a Magnet. I fake out Dondozo to both deal some chip damage and allow Arvin to use either Tail Whip or Takedown with his Greedunt. A Terra boosted Double Shock deletes the rest of Dondozo's HP. Now for the hard part. Fake Out deals solid damage to Tatsugiri, and Greedunt uses Takedown. That's probably Double Shock range, but to be safe, I stall another turn with Protect, as Greedunt takes a Muddy Water and fires back with Tail Whip. Double Shock KOs Tatsugiri to complete the final Titan battle. Sometimes you just have to rely on your teammates. Maridon can now scale cliffs, while Arvin's Mavistiff can play catch again. Spot the difference. Arvin's dad, Professor Turo, asks us to head to the Pocopath Lab, where he tells us to go to Area Zero. 
I still need to beat Team Star first though, which I can start doing right after this battle with Arvin. Not one of his Pokemon has a priority move, so this will be straightforward. Palmet takes out Greedunt with close combat, Meowskarada's Flower Trick knocks out Garganical, Gengar's Sludge Bomb liquefies Go Villain, another two Flower Tricks KO Tentascrew and Cloister, and one Moonblast from Gardevoir serves as a not so welcome back for Mabostiff. That's the Path of Legends down, leaving only one story left Starfall Street. The first Team Star base I want to target is the Fire One, led by Mela. My two partners in crime are Director, I mean, Student, Clive, and a hacker named Cassiopeia. I'm gonna need to choose just 3 Pokemon to auto battle and KO 30 other Pokemon with. Auto battling is a feature in this game that basically just lets you battle in the overworld. The Pokemon you send out will try to fight anything they see. While that sounds bad for this challenge, due to not being able to control the moves that my Pokemon use, I'm not worried. The main factors that influence the outcome of an auto battle are the participants' levels and typings. I'm pretty sure that if your Pokemon has a good type matchup and is at least one level higher than the opponent's, then it should win without taking any damage. My Pokemon are 40 levels higher during this battle, so even bad matchups like Gengar fighting Houndour lead to no damage taken. I'm guessing some stats still matter, since I doubt a Houndour and Houndoom at the same level would be treated equally. I'm also not actually sure if abilities can be a factor, a la Volt Absorb blocking electric moves for example. I heavily doubt it though. Pummet, Gengar, and Gyarados finish wiping out 30 opponents, and I start the boss battle against Mela. Pommet KOs Torkoal with a fake out into close combat, so Mela sends out her Stormobile. The game didn't offer me the option to switch before fighting it, which is basically the only time set mode has been present in this game. The Starmobile, consisting of a heavily modified Riva Room, falls to a Terra boosted Double Shock. Apparently, Penny is a part of this operation and is also good at hacking. Hmm. Next up is the Dark type base, led by Giacomo. This is a job for Gardevoir, Meowskirada, and Pommet. They finish knocking out 30 Pokemon in under 2 minutes, and the battle against Giacomo commences. Pommet KOs his Ponyard with close combat. All the Starmobiles only have one type, which matches the signature type of the squad. So Mela's was a pure fire type, and Giacomo's was a pure dark type. Don Atticus and his poison type squad are next. Gardevoir, Pyroar, and Gyarados win this raid pretty easily, since they're still 30 levels higher. Atticus sends out Skuntank, and I send out Gardevoir. Skuntank only has two moves, the 70 base power dark type Sucker Punch, and the 65 base power super effective Venoshock. Seems obvious what it'll go for. Or not. I am not really sure what happened there. It might be that the AI just chose the move with the higher base power since both moves are neutral or better. It could also just be due to Skuntank having a higher attack. This is marginally concerning, but I do have a way to get around it. I purchase a few more TMs of Protect at a Poke Center, then use one of them on Gardevoir. I run through another 30 Pokemon, then rematch Atticus. This time, I have Gardevoir to Rastalize into a Fairy type and Protect on the first turn. Sure enough, Atticus goes for Sucker Punch again. Sucker Punch is not very effective now, while Venoshock is super effective. Moonblast goes off first, and takes out Skuntank. Apparently, Switch Mode still activates for everything except the Starmobile. Psychic KOs Muck, Reva Vroom, and Mega Reva Vroom to defeat Don Atticus. Fairy Squad time. Gengar, Pyroar, and Gardevoir are in charge of this one. I make sure to avoid battling any Mimikyus because of Disguise. I also make sure Pyroar doesn't battle any Dox Buns because of Well-Baked Body. Yup, that's actually the name of the ability. Basically, Doxbun is immune to Fire-type moves, and whenever it's hit by one, its defense sharply goes up. Even though all these Pokémon are only about 15 to 20 levels lower than mine, they still can't land a hit. Ortega has Pokémon in the lower 50s, so the sledding might be getting a bit tough soon. But not in this battle. Gengar's Sludge Bomb takes out Azumarill, Doxbun, Wigglytuff, and the Starmobile. One base left. Gardevoir, Gengar, and Gyarados should do pretty well against Fighting-types. It's kind of funny how Gyarados is one of my best Pokémon in this raid, even though it knows no flying-type moves. Ares Toxicroak has Sucker Punch, so I'll do the same thing as I did against Atticus. Except I can't Terrastalize. I haven't visited a Poke Center since then, so I never actually recharge my Terra Orb. It doesn't matter here though, since unlike Skuntank, Toxicroak has a super effective move with a higher base power than Sucker Punch. This move is Poison Jab, at a base power of 80. No Sucker Punch comes out, so Psychic takes out Toxicroak. Annihilate faints to Moonblast, Passimian faints to Psychic, and Lucario also faints to Moonblast. That leaves just the Starmobile, which is only 9 levels lower than Gardevoir. Moonblast still cleans though. EV training is really broken. Cassiopeia reveals that they were the original big boss of Team Star, and professional student Clive cannot believe it. In preparation for an upcoming battle, I fly back to Mesa Goza and purchase a Mystic Water. I then grab a Normal Gem from Cascarafa, which boosts the power of a single Normal type move by 30%. I give Gyarados the Mystic Water, and Pommet the Normal Gem. Clive reveals himself to be Director Clavel, and then claims to be Cassiopeia as well. 
He leads off with Oranguru, and I lead with Miyazgarada. Night Slash ends that skirmish. Next is Abomasno, so I send in Pyroar. Flamethrower knocks it out. Third is Gyarados, to which I send up Pommet. Double Shock hits so hard that it turns an NPC into a ghost. Speaking of ghosts, Clavel sends out a Poltegeist, which gets obliterated by Night Slash. Fifth is Amoongus, but it stands no chance against the Gardevoir Psychic. Skeledurge is last, and I send out Pommet again. I click Fake Out into a ghost type, but here's where the newly purchased items will kick in. Clavel terastalizes Skeledurge to turn it into a pure fire type, allowing Fake Out to actually land. The normal gem allows it to do just enough damage, and I switch out into Gyarados the next turn as Skeledurge whiffs an Earth Power. I terastalize Gyarados into a water type, and with the help of the Mystic Water, Waterfall picks up the KO. That critical hit did not matter, as Waterfall would have dealt a minimum of 87% anyways. In the Academy Schoolyard, Cassiopeia reveals her true identity. Not one person saw that coming. Her team is filled with a bunch of evolutions, though every single one has quick attack. As long as they have at least neutral moves above 40 base power though, I shouldn't have to worry. Pommet KOs Umbreon with close combat, and Flareon goes down the same way. I switch in Meowskarata to fight Vaporeon. Vaporeon uses Baby Doll Eyes, a priority move that lowers attack, but doesn't do any damage. Flower Trick ignores attack drops though. Gengar Sludge Bomb KOs Leafeon, and out comes Jolteon. Meowskarata outspeeds and KOs it with Flower Trick. Both Meowskarata and Sylveon terastalize the following turn, but Flower Trick takes advantage of Sylveon's low defense stat to win me the battle. Starfall Street, complete. With all three storylines over, I've unlocked the final episode taking place in Area Zero, The Way Home. I know it's been an entire month, but if you haven't gotten to this part of the game yet, I'd recommend experiencing it for yourselves before watching the rest of the video. There are six required wild Pokemon battles here, and you get a teammate for each one of them. The first is in front of Research Station 1, where we find a Glamora. Lycanroc does the dirty work before Gardevoir can move though. The next Pokemon is Iron Bundle, an Ice and Water type which has a base 136 speed stat. If its IVs are randomized, then Gengar is the only Pokemon I have that's guaranteed to be faster. I switch it to the front of the party, and give it a Magnet. Thunderbolt successfully KOs Iron Bundle. Iron Treads pops up again next, but Pommet KOs it with close combat. The next three battles will be consecutive, meaning I'll need to use the same Pokemon against all three. I teach Gengar a couple of TMs, Protect over Icy Wind, and Psychic over Sludge Bomb. I then switch it to the front of the party and give it the Expert Belt. Time to open the biggest mystery of the game, the Zero Lab. We're immediately ambushed by Paradox Pokemon, starting with Iron Treads. I protect to let Nimona attack with Lycanroc, but it faints after doing a bit of damage. Shadow Ball KOs from that range though. Next up is Iron Hands, a fighting and electric type. Penny's Umbreon hits it with a pretty weak Psychic, but my own Psychic picks up the slack the next turn. The final Wild Paradox Pokemon is Iron Jugulus, a dark and flying type. I protect the first turn as always, and Arvin's Mabastiff does a ton of damage with Play Rough. Thunderbolt KOs Iron Jugulus, leaving only one major fight left in this challenge. I give the Twisted Spoon to Gardevoir and the Magnet back to Pommet, then reteach Gengar Sludge Bomb over Protect. Professor Turo reveals himself to be an AI created by the now deceased real Professor. To stop future Pokemon from taking over Paldea's ecosystem, AI Turo asks me to destroy the lab's time machine, though it's protected by the AI's programming itself. AI Turo sends out Iron Moth, as I send in Pommet. Fake Out deals about a quarter of the future Volcarona's HP, and Double Shock takes out the rest. Next up is Iron Bundle, but it underspeeds Gengar, leaving it susceptible to Thunderbolt. Third is Iron Thorns, a rock electric version of Tyranitar. I send in Meowskarada. One Miracle Seed boosted Flower Trick KOs it. I send out Pommet as AI Turo sends in Iron Jugulus. Another Fake Out and Double Shock take care of the future Hydreigon. Iron Hands is up next, so I send in Gardevoir. It has Fake Out, so I have Gardevoir Protect on the first turn. That leaves Hariyama open to be KO'd by a super effective Twisted Spoon boosted Psychic. Just one more Pokemon left. Iron Valiant is a fairy fighting type and is based on both Golade and Gardevoir. I send out Gengar, and Iron Valiant's booster energy activates, raising its highest stat, which in this case is Attack. Gengar is faster though, and one super effective Sludge Bomb ends this battle. That leads to one final showdown between Maridons, with no other Pokemon being able to be sent out. This battle is always scripted to have your Maridon live on 1 HP and then KO the other, so I can't really do anything about that. AI Turo leaves for the future, Arvin gets absolutely no closure, and I have shown that you can beat the middle 99.8% of Pokemon Violet without taking damage. After an Ed Sheeran jump scare, I find out my final time, 31 hours and 17 minutes. If you enjoyed the video and want to see more content like this, please like and especially subscribe as it really helps out the channel. Also, if you haven't already, make sure to check out some of my other no damage runs. Thanks for watching.